In this section, we're going to start talking about international finance, and we'll begin with the foreign exchange market. This is a market where currencies of different countries are traded, and they're traded at a price, an exchange rate. So, for example, on this particular day, we have these currencies, and we can state them in terms of their value as units of foreign currency per U.S. dollar or U.S. dollars per unit of a foreign currency. These are really just different angles for looking at the same thing. For example, let's say you were going to travel to Japan. And on this date, you went to exchange your dollars for yen so you can shop uh, and do business in Japan. Well, you'd find that for every dollar that you hand over, you're going to get 111 units of the foreign currency, which is yen. Alternatively, another way of looking at that is for every yen, you're going to pay just under one penny, 0 0.009 US dollars. It's important when evaluating exchange rates to determine whether the numbers correspond to units of foreign currency per US dollar or US dollars per unit of foreign currency. Another example, let's say you were going to travel to England. Well, England uses the British pound. So if on this date you went to exchange your U.S. dollars for pounds, you would essentially get 0.786 pounds per U.S. dollar. Alternatively, you could say you would pay 1.272 U.S. dollars per pound. These numbers are reciprocals of each other, which means if you take, let's say, 0.786 and divide that into 1, so 1 over 0.786, you'll get this number here. If you take this number here and divide it into 1, so 1 over 2 point, or 1.272, you'll get this number. So it's an easy conversion to go from one angle to another. When we enter the foreign exchange markets, what we're really doing is participating in two separate markets. The first market is where we're going to be the supplier of a particular currency. So if I'm going to travel to Mexico, I need to first enter the market for U.S. dollars in order to supply them, and then enter the market for pesos in order to demand pesos. And you can see this in our supply and demand model down here. We start over here with the market for U.S. dollars. As with any supply and demand model, we put the quantity of what we're evaluating on the horizontal axis, and we put the price of what we're evaluating on the vertical axis. So we've got quantity of dollars here and the price of dollars. Well, the price of dollars is going to be the pesos per dollar. Just like if this were the market for bread, you would have the quantity of bread here, the price of that bread would be how many dollars you would give up if you're buying bread or how many dollars you would get if you were selling bread. Dollars would be the price of bread. Here we're looking at dollars, so pesos become the price of dollars. If you are buying pesos, you have to give up dollars to get them. If you are selling pesos, you will get dollars. This gives us a demand curve and a supply curve for dollars. Now, the demand curve is downward sloping because it's always inverse to price, meaning that as the price goes up, people demand less. As the price goes down, people demand more. The supply curve is always upward sloping, representing a positive relationship between price and supply. So as the price goes up, people supply more. Price goes down, people supply less. Both curves intersect at what's called equilibrium. Equilibrium is where markets, when left alone, naturally gravitate. We'll see this more in a minute. But understand, in this particular market for dollars, the equilibrium is 10 pesos per dollar. At 10 pesos per dollar, you'll note that the supply and the demand equate, which means the exact number of dollars are supplied that are demanded. And that's what we want to see. 
because we don't want more supply than people want to buy demand, and we don't want too little supply compared to what people demand. We want it to be just right. Now, this is the market for dollars, but we can create a simultaneous market for pesos over here. This is a foreign exchange market, so we're always participating in both markets. And we're going to see quantity of pesos on the horizontal and the price of pesos. Well, the price of pesos is in dollars. Notice the pattern here. Dollar market is denominated in pesos. Peso market is denominated in dollars. If we had the bread market, it would be denominated in dollars. If we had the car market, it would be denominated in dollars. So on and so forth. The supply curve for pesos is upward sloping. The demand curve for pesos is downward sloping. They come together at an equilibrium price exchange rate. In this particular market, we have 0.1 or 10 cents per peso. Notice something here. These markets are related. We're always participating in both. And as a result, the equilibrium price for pesos, which is 10 cents, is the reciprocal of the equilibrium price for dollars, which is 10. 1 over 0.1 is 10, and 1 over 10 is 0.1, consistent with what we learned a minute ago. Remember, two different angles for looking at the same thing. Now, let's understand the process of engaging in these markets. Let's say there is U.S. demand for Mexican goods. In other words, you want to travel to Mexico or you want to buy something from Mexico. Well, what that's going to do is it going to, it's going to create a demand for pesos. You got to get the pesos to buy the goods. That is where this demand curve in the peso market comes from. But that simultaneously creates a supply of dollars in the market for dollars. You have to supply your dollars to get those pesos. So you'll notice that the supply of dollars in the dollar market is connected to the demand for pesos in the peso market. We supply dollars to demand pesos to buy things in Mexico. Similarly, if there is Mexican demand for U.S. goods, this is going to create a demand for dollars demand for U.S. dollars. Of course, for those Mexicans to get those dollars, to demand those dollars, they have to supply pesos. So the supply curve is connected to the demand curve for dollars in order to buy U.S. goods. Mexicans supply pesos to demand dollars to go shopping in America. Once you understand this, then we can start to apply our um, markets to the real world. And we'll do that more in a minute. But before we get there, let's talk about how exchange rates will change over time based on the supply and demand. In a floating exchange rate system, which simply means that the price of the respective currencies are allowed to move, the prices are allowed to move, we would expect to see the markets gravitate towards equilibrium. For example, this is the market for dollars, quantity of dollars traded on the horizontal. And on the vertical, we have the price of dollars. Now, in this particular case, it's denominated in yen. So we're looking at the dollar market and the yen market. To understand this, Let's take a look at equilibrium. Well, at 120 yen per dollar, the supply equals the demand. That's where, as I said, the market will gravitate. But let's just imagine for a minute that, in fact, the current exchange rate is not 120. Let's say it's 150 yen per dollar. Well, this creates a bit of an issue because at 150 yen per dollar, you'll notice that the supply exceeds the demand. At that high exchange rate, the suppliers of dollars, Americans for the most part, 
are going to be getting a lot of yen. So they're going to want to supply a lot of dollars. Demanders of dollars, in this case, primarily Japanese, they're going to have to pay a lot to get those dollars, 150 yen. So they're not going to want to demand as much. So the result is a surplus of dollars. Now, you probably know that any time there's a surplus of a product in a market, it drives prices down. If you go to the store and you see there's inventory of a particular product just spilling off the shelves and no one's buying it, eventually the business lowers the price to get those units sold. And that's what happens with currency as well. If the dollars are so high priced that there's a surplus, then those dollars are going to have to come down in price. And as that happens, as we go from 150 yen to 149 to 148, you'll notice the gap between these two lines, the difference between supply and demand gets smaller and smaller until we reach equilibrium. That means when there's a surplus, there are forces that will cause the price of dollars to go down, which in currency terminology we call a depreciation. The dollar would depreciate when we have a surplus, and it would depreciate, in this case, from 150 to 120. That makes the dollar a weak currency when there's a surplus, because it's going to lose value as it moves from 150 to 120. In contrast, let's start at 100. Let's say for one reason or another, the exchange rate is 100 yen per dollar. Well, that sends a signal to suppliers to not supply many dollars. Americans don't want to supply a lot of dollars because they're only getting 100 yen for them. But that sends a message to the demanders of dollars, the Japanese, to buy a lot. It's cheap. This creates a shortage of dollars. Demand exceeds supply. Now, again, you've probably seen when there's a shortage of a good, prices tend to go up. And that's what's going to happen. The price of dollars is going to start to move up to 101, 102, 103, all the way up to equilibrium 120. In other words, as the price goes up because of the shortage, the gap between supply and demand is going to get smaller and smaller until it's gone. When this happens, we would see the dollar appreciate. Price of dollars going up is the same as appreciation, which would make the dollar a strong currency. It would be gaining value. Notice the pattern here. Whenever there is a disequilibrium in the form of a surplus or a shortage, exchange rates change, ultimately bringing about an equilibrium in that market.